to Old Path Ministries in our study through the Gospel of John. We um, we ended um, right in the middle of chapter 15 the last time, and uh, we got to verse 17. I cut it off there because uh, when you get to verse 18, though it's in the middle of the chapter, everything changes. Everything that he says to them changes dramatically in a verse. So before I set this up, and we're only going to go through the first th- through the end of chapter 15 and the first four verses of uh, of chapter um, 16, because at verse five it moves on to this ministry of the Holy Spirit, and so I want to you know take this as the topics that he discusses are so radically different. I don't want to run one of them into another. So what I mean by all of this, and I, I want to make sure that we're really super careful about something as well. I tried to make a big point of this last uh, last time at the beginning of the chapter or the part that we've covered so far. Context means everything if we're going to fully understand what is being said. Now, a lot of times the the default way of looking at the scripture is to think that, especially in the Gospels, whenever Jesus says something, it's almost as though we think that he's, t- he's talking right past the original audience and he's speaking to us directly 2,000 years later. What we should be doing, and be very, very careful about this, is to look at any particular text and make sure that we understand directly who the the audience or the target audience is. Then after that, and we understand what's being said, then it is for us to make application to us here and now. We have a prime example, a perfect example here in chapter 15, because as far as the uh, audience is concerned, it's the disciples. So when he talks to them in the first 17 verses, remember what has been said to them. He's talking about, again, it's all preparation for him leaving. He's about to go and give his life for the sin of mankind, but they are going to be left without him being with them every single day. So everything that he does from this point on is to prepare them for the things that are going to be coming next. And so it's important that we understand kind of like the fly on the wall, listening to the discussion that goes on between he and they, because he's going to tell them the things that are going to happen to them after he's gone. And the the cautions and the warnings that he gives to them are specifically for them. Now, when we get past that part and we look at those texts and the, the, the things that he gives to them in the way of, I guess you could say, warning, we are able then to make application and say, okay, therefore, what he said to them how much of that is still happening here in our world today? So depending on where you are in the world, that answer is going to be a little different. And I'll get to that when we get to those, those passages. But it's, again, monumentally important that we understand all of the bits and pieces of this. Jesus is, in these moments, depending on who you, you, know, who you believe, um, there are two views of this. Because of what we see at the end of verse 14, where Jesus says, let us go from here. And so it's that idea of chapters 15, 16, and 17. Did they still happen in the upper room? Because what Jesus says to them in verse 14 is, let's go and we'll be leaving this place. Was this said said to them as they're making preparation to go to the the, uh, Garden of Gethsemane? Or... Did Jesus say these things as they walked into that direction? Now, I know that last week I had said I'll put up a picture of this, and I neglected to do it, my mistake. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put something up at, at the beginning here as I'm laying all this out that gives us an idea of where the proximity of these things were. And it's very, very close by. Um, the, the walk is not that far for them to go. So with all of that said, here is Jesus speaking to the disciples. Let's remember, there isn't a Christian on the planet at this point because Jesus had not yet died. He had not resurrected. The price for sin had not been paid. And so for somebody to identify with him, Christianity as we know it, the ones who have had their sin forgiven because of his shed blood and regenerated by the Holy Spirit or being born again, none of that was in place. So as Jesus speaks to them, he's speaking to them as Jewish men, and men who were about to have their whole world tossed upside down, if you would. Now, by the time that the things that Jesus cautions them about, by the time that those things do take place, these men would then be considered what we would say Christian. Jewish men living in the, in the nation of Israel, of the tribes of Israel, 
yet they had come to believe in Jesus as the awaited Messiah. They were born again. They would be, they would be people that we would call nowadays Christians, but they come from a Jewish background and a Jewish understanding. All of that is hugely important because one of the cautions that Jesus gives when we get to chapter 16 is the opposition that will come against them from the, the religious elites of the time. But let's remember that he starts to use terms about them that they'll be hated in the, the more general sense, but then very specific. And it would have much greater meaning to a person of Jewish descent because of what it means to be, as we would think about it, kind of cut away from being the kind of the commonwealth of, of the, the Jewish people, the temple and that, you know, that, that whole, their whole life and their culture and their, their belief system was based around the temple and the things taking place there and the, you know, doing things with accordance to the law. And up to this point, Jesus never asked them to do anything that would be seen as going against the law. He was telling them things that would make the, the law become more complete in their understanding, which is why we get from uh, Matthew's gospel, when you get to the end of the Beatitudes, and Jesus says, don't think that I've come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So everything that the law would require would be fulfilled by Jesus and in the perfect way very shortly hereafter, because he's going to offer himself as a sacrifice. Now, Jesus is the one who knows that all of those things are about to take place. Remember that everything that we're reading here is Jesus preparing the disciples for a world without him. That's what this is all about. So it is not only to prepare them for that, but also here's what to expect going forward. I won't be there with you, but here's how the world is going to interact towards you. And here's the things that's going to take place. That is going to carry through fifth, the rest of 15, 16 into 17. All of this, remember, is preparation for these men in a world in which he will not be present with them, but there again, repeatedly, is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Very, very important for us to remember that all of this works together. So, <clears throat> one last time, context is a very select group of people, Jewish men, and their life in the nation of Israel and Jerusalem in particular is what's in focus here, and now they're being told of what to expect going forward in the very near future. As we get to these passages, we'll look at them, and what's the application for us here today? Let's not look past them just to get to us. Let's make sure we understand what was said to them, why it mattered, how it played out historically. We know that, but what does it mean to us here today? So with all that said, let's have a word of prayer, and let's take a look at the text. Father, we thank you as you gather us here in this uh, in this time, in a world that we have that is in a great deal of turmoil in the beginning of 2021. We ask, Lord, that you would give us understanding according to your word. And as we study this history, knowing how it played out in the lives of the apostles, we pray that as we make application to our lives, if there are things here that really kind of translate into us, into our times, may we be attentive. So I thank you that we are able to come before you and that you speak to us through your word. And we pray, Father, that we would be attentive to the things that are here, that we would understand them. We give you all thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Chapter 15. Remember, he begins by saying, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you haven't heard it, go back and look at it last week because I know that it is somewhat controversial. Um, and I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time rewinding that. But the idea of the believer, we don't earn our way to heaven, but we are to stay close to him. There's no life in the believer without life in Jesus. So he tells us to abide with him. That doesn't make works, uh, that doesn't make salvation a works matter. It just basically says that there is no salvation unless you are abiding or your faith is, is, is planted firmly in the person of Jesus and all of the things that he did. So we don't have to earn our way to heaven, but it is still, nonetheless, if we don't believe and we don't have faith in him, there is no salvation in that because what he did was done for us and only those who would appropriate that or take that to them are the ones that would be saved. We've heard the analogy a lot of times. You can see a person who doesn't know how to swim who's drowning and you can throw them a life preserver and they could drown right next to it. They have to take that and put it upon themselves they have to appropriate what that, that life-saving uh, apparatus will do. It'll keep them afloat, and it will keep them from dying. So same kind of a thing. 
Jesus offers to us a way to keep from eternal separation from him. Now, it's right there, but until you take that and say, I accept and receive that gift that will keep me alive and that will lead to eternal life, until we take that upon ourselves, then there's no hope for us. We can't get there by our own efforts. Now, the big debate is, if a person was to to be drowning, using the analogy, take the life preserver, can they ever throw it back and allow themselves to drown? If we believe in free will, then free will is free will. Now, whether people want to argue about that, great, let them argue. That's fine. It's not like I haven't heard all the arguments before, but that's what I see in the text. And that seriously is what, what chapter 15 in the first 17 verses deals with. But remember, this is to give them great comfort. This is my relationship that I have with you, and I want that relationship that I have with you to be among one another, and then I want you to pass it on. That's the message of that whole passage. Now, notice as we see at verse 17, it says, Now these things I command you. This is a commandment that I give to you. Love one another. So everything about what has happened in the first 17 verses would be to the person who's hearing it right there with him, all the people that we know by name, the apostles, those are the people that are hearing this, and it would be incredibly comforting. But notice in one verse the total pivot. I've loved you. I've called you my friends. I don't call you servants. I've made everything that, the, that my father has, has made known to me. I've made it known to you. There's a relationship between the believer, in this case the disciples, and the one who called them. He, he's the one who called them to follow him up in Galilee three years prior to this. So these are the guys who are hearing all this. Now notice, there's a love between these men and the one who called them, but the world will be totally the opposite. And that's what he, he deals with at verse 18, and it runs through the end of, um, of uh, the chapter, and then it really leads into chapter 16. So let's like, take a look at the, the, the text. Something I want to point out to you. You'll see in verse 18, the first word in, in 18, the first word in 19, uh, the first word in verse 22, and in verse 24, it uses that, that word if. So it is a qualifying kind of thing. If this, if this is the case, then this will be the result. So you find that that's rhetorical in, in the way that the scripture is written, and it, it's all throughout. Paul does it. We do it ourselves. There are these conditions. This will happen if this is what happens before it. And that's exactly what he's doing here. So look at this. <clears throat> the first of his ifs. Now, if the world hates you, then you know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, this word in, in, in the Greek is used 42 times. Meseo is the word in Greek. And it really means just what we see in English. But it, it's, it's got a companion to it that we'll get to in a couple of verses. So the hatred that the world was going to have for them. Now notice world means the larger group. It doesn't have to be just the Jews, and it doesn't have to be, I should say, just the religious leaders there in Israel. It's going to happen wherever they go. They will meet opposition. There will be those people who don't want to hear what they have to say and will oppose them to the point of putting them to death if they can. So this is what they have to look forward to. But he says this to them, and it, is, it, it should give them some level of comfort. They're not going to hate you because of who you are. They're going to hate you because of who I am. So he says, now, if the world hates you, and you find yourself wondering, why does the world hate me so much? Then he says, just know that it hated me first. Application. Remember, he is talking directly to them. If we want to make application to this, this still happens to us today. Now, why is that? Well, Odd, or obviously enough, it's because we have Jesus in common with these men 2,000 years ago. How is it going to, to work in their lives? He's going to explain that to them, and their experience in this is going to be different than ours. Because they're living in first century Jerusalem in a, in a time when, up to this point, the Pharisees and the religious leaders have made their opposition to Jesus plain. They hate him. They want him dead. And they want to wipe out the disciples as well because you've got to get rid of all the evidence. This is their, their plot. It's been that way all along. Jesus knows it. He's already said those things. So verse 18 starts that way. Now, if the world hates you, then you know that it hated me first. He says this. Here's another qualifier. This is just, I guess you could almost say, it's just common sense. 
And it is also supposed to get the focus off of them and put the focus on the Lord, which is where their eyes should be at all time. Application to us, that's where our eyes should be all the time. So once again, qualifier. Now, if the world were um, would love, I'm sorry, if uh, you were of the world, then the world would love its own. Okay, so there's the qualifier. If you were still who you were before, then there wouldn't be a problem here. The things that are about to happen to you, they're going to happen to you because you're no longer of the world, because you have come to believe in him. The world already hates him, so by definition, it will hate you as well. Because you've been removed out of the world. You've been changed. So to the disciple, to the, to the apostle, to us here today, if there's opposition to all the things that we believe, don't be surprised because the world celebrates itself. And they, just, they celebrate all kinds of horrid, wretched things. But it's because it's what they all believe and it's what they all do. The believer is supposed to stand apart from those things and it makes you stand out. I've never seen our country, I've seen it in the world before, but I've never seen in our country how if you go against what is public orthodoxy, the idea of trying to erase everything about what is said or believed by those people is just normal. It's common. We're seeing censorship taking place. Think about this. Two years ago, were we even using the terms cancel culture? Were we using it a year ago? Now look at how if you have something that you believe or say that runs outside of what's acceptable, they want to make it as though you never existed. They erase the things that you've said, the things that you have on your in the public. They just have those things removed. And it's happening all over the place. Well, same with them. So if, once again, you were of this world, then the world would love its own. You'd be one of them. Yet, here's, again, it's that contrast. Yet... Because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. So again, let's make sure the context is followed to the letter here. When he talks about his choosing of them, these were the ones that he called to himself in Galilee. So everything about them is identified as they're his disciples. To the Jewish mentality... To call yourself a disciple looks at the person of whom you are a disciple, a rabbi, a teacher. Jesus would have been considered, in Jewish terms, their rabbi, their teacher. And it's still to this day the same thing. Whoever your rabbi is, you're devoted to learning that person's teachings. It hasn't changed in 2,000 years. So there are plenty of rabbis going around at the time. There are plenty of teachers, and they have plenty of people that were disciples. We have a couple of examples of it. John the Baptist is a great example. He had his disciples. There were the things that he was saying and teaching, and people were drawn to him. But remember, Jesus called this particular group and said, follow me, and they did. Now, I am, again, one of those people who believes firmly when he says, follow me, it was an invitation and not a command, because I believe that they had the ability to say, thanks, but no thanks. But they didn't. These ones followed him, did exactly as he is saying here. That's what I, I believe he means by saying that I chose you. We have the evidence of it. We see where it happened. Again, so it was an invitation. Now, let's fast forward to our times. Once again, we could say very much in the same way. Jesus has put out the invitation to us. I choose you. Here, come to me. But I still believe that we have the ability to say yes or no to that call, just like these ones did. But let's stay with context. Let's not read more into it than what's being said here. To those people, I called you. I chose you. You answered that call. You answered that, that uh, invitation. So because of that, he says, I chose you out of the world, and therefore, that's why the world hates you. That idea of being called out. Now, let's be really, really careful with this, too, making application to us. We are not asked to come to our relationship with the Lord and then just go on with our lives like nothing ever happened. If we genuinely know that, that Jesus has things that he has taught, then remember who he taught them to, because those are the men who wrote after the fact. So when we look at guys like here in the Gospel of John, John's writing these things. He was the eyewitness. He's just giving us the eyewitness details to this, as moved upon by the Holy Spirit. Same goes for Peter, same goes for James, same goes for Paul. Paul was not one of these guys yet. He would be added later. If you want to see how he deals with that, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15. That apostle born out of due season, as he says. 
He was once an enemy, and then God chose him to come out of all of that. He answered that call, and he was a changed man. So, remember, when it comes to, without going too far out of it, verse uh, chapter 9 of the book of Acts is where we get that whole thing. So, Paul is on his way, as he's known Saul, his, his Jewish name. He's on his way to Damascus to wipe out the church, persecuting him, just like what Jesus said would be happening here. Paul was looking to do exactly those things, or Saul as we would know him. Um, he's on his way there. But notice even in that time with Damascus, on his way to Damascus, when Jesus meets him on the road, he says to him, why is it that you are persecuting me? And so he reveals himself to Paul, and Paul, you know, we don't have all the details of it, it just is said matter-of-factly, um, he accepts what what is presented before him. And then he starts to learn what that means, beginning with this man who meets him uh, in um, uh, in Damascus, Ananias. So you can go read that for yourself, chapter 9. Pretty interesting thing how that goes down. But he becomes one of these, these apostles, one of these disciples of Jesus. And he becomes, you know, really influential, clearly. But we have all, all of his writings. Now, verse 20 tells us this. Now, remember the word that I had said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. And you see in verse uh, or chapter uh, 13, verse 16 is where he says that. Here we come to, in verse 20, another one of those ifs. So here it says this. Now, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they would keep yours as well. So once again, this helps them to understand they have rejected me and that's why they will reject you. It's, it's a foregone conclusion as he lays it out here. It's not really up for debate. This is what is going to take place. So once again, one of those ifs. Now this word persecute here is dioko. It means it's, it's basically to pursue after or put them to flight. And remember how I had said that this is kind of companion to hatred. Let's put those two words together because sometimes they almost get that, that um, the, the word hatred, when we saw it in uh, Missio uh, in, uh, a little bit earlier, it means that you can hate them to the point where you pursue after them. So these two words are basically the same thing. The day is going to come because you have identified with me, they are going to pursue after you and put you to flight because they so hate you. Now, before we read any more on this, let's take a look at how that kind of rolled out in the book of Acts. It happened exactly like this. Think about what takes place in the book of Acts if we do it in big picture, looking at the, the, the way that it is uh, laid out for us. Chapter 1, they're wondering what to do. Jesus gives them instruction go and wait in Jerusalem until the until the promise of the Father, which is the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. They gather up somebody to take um, uh, Judas's place, Matthias, that's in chapter 1, and then comes chapter 2, and it's Pentecost. They're assembled there in Jerusalem, and just as was promised, Jesus tells them that you will be endowed with power from, from heaven, and that is dunamis. It's the power of the Holy Spirit to do miraculous things, Verse 8, I think that is, of, uh, or it's a little bit further than that in chapter 1. But that happens in chapter 2. They're in the upper room. The Spirit comes upon them. Some of them begin to speak in tongues. They speak it in such a way that it is understandable to people who are there at Pentecost from other parts of the world. These men from Galilee are speaking their language. Peter is given the gift of evangelism at that point, and he explains all of those things, and thousands come to saving knowledge of Jesus. Chapter 3, a very notable um, uh, healing takes place in chapter 3. And once again, there is evangelism that takes place and thousands more come to believe in Jesus because of this miraculous healing. So we see all of that. Peter's able to do that. By chapter 4, they start to get the attention of the powers that be. And they begin to start to threaten them and asking, why are you doing what you're doing? And now they start to come onto the radar of the religious leaders there in Jerusalem. By chapter 5, there starts to be the thing of church discipline that takes place. Ananias and Sapphira, that takes place. Later on in chapter 5, there's another persecution. It starts to really ramp up. It gets to be the point of physical violence. Chapter 6, they begin to have some of the growing pains of a church. And, you know, people 
jockeying for things and complaining and all the rest of that stuff. And they have to start putting things in order, what we would consider somewhat church structure. Compared to the church structure we see nowadays, it's nothing compared to what was happening though in those days. It wasn't a business like church has become so much nowadays. By chapter 7, the things that Jesus is warning about are really beginning to hit their stride because persecution is no longer threats. It's no longer beatings. It is actually being put to death. Stephen, the first martyr of the church, is killed because he's a disciple. By chapter 8, you get towards the point where the, it had become so grievous that people were no longer even in, in Jerusalem as the church. And you read that because it tells us in chapter 8 that by that time uh, of chapter 8, only the disciples are left of the church there in Jerusalem. So that tells you the things that Jesus is talking about here. Everything that he said would happen began to happen that way. And the persecution of the church was going to leave past Jerusalem. That's why we have in chapter 9, Paul on his way to Damascus to try to imprison and to do the damage to the church that he does there. By chapter 10, we have Peter and uh, the whole uh, thing with Cornelius. And now the, the, the good news of the gospel is making its way to the Gentiles. So the book of Acts helps us to pick up on all of that in real vivid detail of what happened after Jesus spoke these words. And it was going to begin happening in them within just days of these events by Pentecost 50 days later after that. Man, oh man, it's really, it's on. And it happens in very, very quick order. So with all that said, hopefully that is helpful. And you can go and read those things for yourself. Read those verses or those chapters in, in Acts and you'll see everything that Jesus is warning them about happens very, very quickly after the church is put together. Now, with that said, Let's read verse 20 again. Remember the word that I said to you. That's the, the, you need to recognize this. A servant is no greater than his master. And because of that, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. They're going to put you to flight. Why? Because there's nothing different about you. They hated me, your master, and you're not greater than I am. So don't think that they're going to give you a pass. Because of me, they're going to do likewise with you. So... Notice what he says this. This is so cool. Verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake. Why is that? Because they do not know him who sent me. There you, there you have another very, very important layer to this. Because not only is their rejection of Jesus a, a, an offense that will lead to an eternity separated, but because of their hatred for him, they never saw that the Father was the one who sent him in the first place, which he said to them repeatedly. Jesus and his contesting with the Pharisees at all times was always pointing back to the Father. Basically, it's this way if I wanted to paraphrase it. I didn't just show up here to do these things. I'm here because I was sent by the Father. So if you reject me, you reject him because he's the one who sent me. Now, he has said that openly. He has said that to the Pharisees. And when he says it directly to the Pharisees around the temple, there's all the masses who are hearing this. The people who are listening to this going back and forth repeatedly heard that. Now here he, he boils it down. You disciples, you've heard this as well. Now, they've rejected me. They're going to reject you. But remember, the rejection of all of this is ultimately to God the Father because he's the one who sent. Now, you'll notice that as you read through the epistles, and uh, the things that, that um, uh, Peter will say in his evangelism, it picks up on all of this, that it's God the Father who has been working behind the scenes from the beginning of them as a nation up until this time that he sent his son. And he was put to death for the sin of mankind. And the Father resurrected him from the dead. So it's that understanding that they are all present and part of this salvation. So we go to... Um, we go to verse 21. Let's read that again. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake. Now, it's not because, or it's not him saying they might do this. I mean, they didn't like me too much, but maybe they'll be okay with you. No, it's like this happened to me. This is going to happen to you. So, and that the reason for that, because, I love when he puts this in here, because it, it keeps us from having to wonder. Why is this? Because they have... Um, uh, because they did not know him who sent me. Here's another one of those ifs, verse 22. 
if I had come and spoken to them, if I had not rather come and spoke to, spoken to him, goodness, I am so sorry. Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. There's going to be two parts to this. He's going to give the other counter to it. You know, obviously uh, the, the both sides of it basically saying the same thing. If I had not revealed these things to them, they could have pled ignorance. That's the important part. So he's telling the disciples, had I not come and told them all these things, helped to point out their hypocrisy, then there would be no accountability. They wouldn't have any sin. They wouldn't have any recognition of their sin. Also, remember that the things that he is about to do is going to be a fulfillment of everything that is in the law. And he reminds them of that, that he would be the one who would suffer and all that. So, so much of this is, it was prophetic. Jesus is fulfilling those prophetic things. And as a result of that, they will be without excuse. Now let's make application here. It's the same thing now that we as believers are supposed to do when we present to others why it is that we believe what we believe and then offer to them their, their opportunity to come to the Lord and to seek him for his forgiveness and that they too can have that relationship with him. Once we make them responsible and accountable to that, then that decision is on them and no one's going to put it to our account. Well, why didn't you tell them? So here Jesus, once again, because he was doing what God had sent him to do, he told them all the things that they needed to hear. Had they not heard it, they could have pled ignorance. But they could not do so. And he says that. But now, he says, verse 22, the second part, they have no excuse for their sin. So again, remember, he's identified it and shown that they are responsible for it and guilty of it. And now that they know it, they can't have an excuse. Well, nobody told me. Yeah, he did. He told you in detail. So with all of that said, verse 23, so it says this, Now he who hates me hates my father also. So great. The hatred for the father turns into hatred for the son, which turns into hatred for his followers, his disciples. It was going to play out in their lives in the very near future. They were going to see it within a matter of hours, frankly, and days for sure. Now, fast forward 2,000 years. We can look the same way. The more that a person holds to biblical truth and to biblical morality in this world and that God has a standard and that, you know, we, we if we support that and say he has views on things of morality and marriage and sexuality and gender, he has opinions on all of those things. If we dare to say those things openly from the Bible, there is a real genuine hatred of that. So nothing has changed from these times. How it was going to play out and how it was going to affect them would change a little bit from their time to ours. But nonetheless, it's still a problem. So with that being said, uh, the person who hates me also hates my father. Here's another one of those ifs, verse 24. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, then they would have no sin. But now they have seen and they have also hated both me and my father. Remember, he's, he's telling them all of what is the motivation for it. So there's the accountability of the things that he said. And now also there's the accountability of them. They can't plead ignorance because I just disagreed with what he said. Yeah, but look at the things that he did, which no one else can possibly do. That should put some level of curiosity in them to say, well, maybe there is more to this than we're thinking. Maybe our opposition is not very well placed because look at what he's able to do. Maybe we should take a, a closer look at this. So Jesus uses this when he reasons with them in other places before it came to the last night. He was able to say, look, if you don't want to believe my words, believe my words because of the works that I do. And those are done by the Father through me. So you remember those times when he was talking with the Pharisees? I think that's around chapters 8 and other places. He says the very same things. How can you, how can you not see the things that are taking place and realize that there is a power behind it? You should at least be somewhat curious. I believe exactly, it's pretty obvious from the text, that is precisely what brought Nicodemus to him in chapter 3. Isn't that what Nicodemus says? How can you do the things that you do? If I paraphrase it. So 
Nicodemus's reasoning is, man, I don't even get this whole thing, but no one can do what you do unless God is with him. But help me understand here. That's why Nicodemus came to him at first and still didn't really get all of the answers that he wanted to. He did eventually because he was a disciple by the time that Jesus was put to death. He comes with Joseph of Arimathea to uh, to pick up the body of Jesus. Nicodemus is present with that. We're going to read that here in a few chapters. So with that being said, these ifs, if the world hates you, it hated me first. And if the world's going to persecute you, it persecuted me first. If they had loved me, you know, it, all these ifs. So here's the verse 24. If, I'm sorry, um, that, that if of verse 24, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen, and they have also hated both me and my father. So they've seen with their own eyes, they've heard with their ears, and there's still rejection. But notice this. But this happened, that the word, the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. Now that's taken, there's a couple of places where you'll find that. It's in the Psalms, um, I wrote it down, Psalm 35, 19, Psalm 69, 4. Interestingly enough, if you read the Psalms, and when David said that, probably didn't realize that there was much in the way of this being a prophetic thing, because that was David's problem. He had plenty of people who hated him, and he says those things. But what's so interesting about it is that Jesus, who is a direct descendant of David, is able to say, as it was with David, my ancestor, so also is it with me. And he's able to use the psalm and make an application to saying that was speaking not only to David in his time, but it was speaking through the generations prophetically to me right here. So notice Jesus takes those two psalms and says, those apply directly to me, though David would have had the immediate fulfillment of that. Now Jesus is having it fulfilled in, per, in, in its perfection in his life. Verse 26. Now, notice how he changes once again. Very, very important part, and it will lead us to verse 5, which we're going to leave for, for next week because it, it just is too important to try to fit in. Verse 26. Now, when the Helper comes, now we already know he's promised that, chapter 14, and this is going to happen not very long after. The Holy Spirit is going to be given to them in two separate ways. First of all, the Holy Spirit will get, be given to them by taking residence in them. It's chapter 14, verse 17, that the Holy Spirit that is going to be sent to you will be, future tense, in you. You're going to have him residing in you. That happens when we get to chapter 20, which I'll point out when Jesus breathes upon them. They received the Holy Spirit at that point. But what happened in chapter 2 was different. And Jesus kind of differentiates that by saying, go and wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. But he had already breathed upon them in chapter 20 of John. So for people to try to say that being born again is what happened at Acts chapter 2 is just not being careful with the text. We'll look at that when we get to chapter 20. We'll go through all of those things. So, verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, notice all three are mentioned there, Jesus speaking about the Spirit independently of himself, independently of the Father, I'm going to send to you from the Father. The, the Spirit is present with them. He's Obviously, the Holy Spirit's there in the midst, but because of what Jesus will be able to do, the Holy Spirit would also be sent to them in the, the personal companion way, indwelling them. Different. Never seen before. The Spirit was upon them. He was upon David. He was upon Samson. He was upon Elijah. The Spirit was always present doing things, but never dwelling in them. This is what Jesus is saying. You're going to be indwelt by him. Notice, it's the Spirit who proceeds from the Father, and this one, the Spirit, he will testify of me. Because look at how, how cool this is. I have testified of the Father. I'm going to be going back to the Father. But I'm not going to leave you without hope. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit coming from the Father to indwell you. So there will be someone to lead you and guide you, though not in physical form, but he'll be in. That's why the believer, when they hear these things, makes perfect sense to them. They understand when I am reading this and going through the explanation of it, it's like the believer goes, oh, okay, totally understand that. It makes perfect sense. It wouldn't if the Spirit was not residing in the believer. To the non-believer, they would read these kind of things and go, I can understand the English, but I don't fully comprehend it. 
if at that point they said, I would like to comprehend it, great. If you're doing that right now, for some reason you're watching this and you would like to say, I would, I would love to have that level of confidence and belief and assurance that is in that, great. We were all there at one time. It's as simple as saying, God, reveal yourself to me. And then how does that happen? Recognizing what Jesus did, died on the cross for the sin of mankind. But it's not just sitting out there. You have to get to the point of saying, I accept and believe that you did what you did, or that, that uh, Jesus did what he did. And so, Father, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins because you've made it possible that Jesus died for my sins and paid for it, poor, uh, for my life with his blood. He rose from the dead so that I can have the hope of eternal life. So, Father, come in. I receive. that. You know, However you say the prayer, there's no right way of saying it or wrong way of saying it. It's just basically saying, you have invited me. I accept that invitation. And you'll spend the rest of your life trying to even get a glimpse of learning and understanding what that is. But the promise is the Holy Spirit is given to the believer and he would lead us and guide us. So I heard Pastor Chuck say at one time, what Jesus represented to the apostles, the Holy Spirit now is that to us. The one that we could come to and say, guidance, help, assistance, you know, help me understand these things. The, the apostles could have done that with, the, with Jesus because he was right there with them. In his absence, we do the same thing with the Holy Spirit. Really wonderful. Great, great way of understanding that we have this incredible relationship that was offered to us. So, uh, in verse 27, And you also, you will bear witness. Now, why is that? Because you have been with me from the beginning. Isn't that great? If they are empowered by the Holy Spirit and they go out and they do the things that they do, if anybody was to say, well, why should I listen to you? They'd be able to say, because we've been with him before anybody knew who he was. We've been him, we, we have been with him since he first talked to us in Galilee. We've been with him everywhere he goes. We've seen everything that he's done, all of his miracles, all of his teachings. We've seen there. We've, we've been witnesses of it all. And even after his death, we're as convinced about it as we could have ever been because we've seen him resurrected. We've seen him raised from the dead, just like he said. Now, remember, as Jesus is saying this, he's talking about things that are going to happen in days from this event. But he is speaking about them like it's not up for debate. It's not this might happen. This is what will happen as time progresses, which tells you just how in control of all these things he was. They still didn't fully understand it. They couldn't have possibly grasped it to that degree. But that's really where we are in this. He's telling them, here's what is going to take take place next, and here is why it's going to take place. It's really, really cool stuff that he is saying to them. Verse 27, let's read it one more time. You also, you are going to bear witness. You are going to give this testimony. Why is that? Well, because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, look at verse 16. Very, very, chapter 16, hugely important. Sometimes, once again, we get stuck in the idea that the the uh, chapters break up what we're reading in the Bible. Just remember, Jesus didn't say chapter 16. It's a continuing thought. How do we know that? Because he said, these things I've spoken to you. What things? The things that we've been reading. I've said these things to you. Now, why would you have said these things to us? He's going to answer that question. These things I have spoken to you. Now, why is that? That you should not be made to stumble. Oh, boy. He has said this to them before. He's told them, you're going to be offended because of me. You're going to stumble because of me. I'm telling you this so that you're stumbling, though you're going to get caught off guard and freaked out here shortly. It's not going to be a permanent condition. Your stumbling, unfortunately, is going to happen but for a time. But these men will ultimately continue on with him. But had Jesus not said all these things, the persecution is going to come. The hatred is going to come. Understand where it's all coming from. Where does it have its origins? Its origins are from the people who don't know my father, so they didn't know me. They wouldn't look at the things that I said or the things that I did. They wouldn't look at the miracles because they hated the father in the first place. Now, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around it, but they were the Jews. They were the men in the temple. Yeah, but they were corrupt too. So to them, it was a vocation and a business. Sounds like a lot of the pastors nowadays. But these are people who put up all the pretense, but if they had really understood who Jesus was, they would have never resisted him because he had been promised 
for generations, for hundreds, thousands of years by this time. Remember the promise that the nations would be blessed through the tribe of, or through the, the sons of Abraham. They're 2,000 years after that promise. So the prophets had spoken. Here Jesus is. They're rejecting him. So, of course, that helps us to understand. I've told you about these things that you would not be made to stumble. I'm going to give you reasons to continue on because you're going to have everything about what you believe challenged. So then verse 2, here's what's going to happen. They're going to put you out of the synagogues. What's the synagogue? It's the place of corporate worship. The temple was where the sacrifices happened, but the synagogues are the places where the people came together for teaching and for the, you know, the, the fellowship and the, the face-to-face of that whole thing. It was the life of the of the Jewish person, of the devout, was to be a part of the synagogue. So nothing could be worse than being cut out or excommunicated from that. Even though they realized Jesus represented something so different, we're talking about the day-to-day life of people. They wouldn't have a place where they could collectively come together to fellowship. They would be cast out of those things. So we know that they weren't coming from the synagogue in, in the book of Acts when they came to the temple. They were outside of it, and that's why they, they were seen as outsiders by that time, just as Jesus was. Remember? He was able to speak in the synagogues up in Galilee, but he wasn't really welcomed in Jerusalem. Well, because of everything, they're going to be put out of the synagogues. They're not going to be accepted as part of the Jewish nation at this point because of their identifying with him. They're going to put you out of the synagogues. Yes, it goes further. Further. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that they offer God a service. Stephen is our first example of that. Now, we know from tradition and what we would call history that all of the disciples, the the apostles in particular, were put to death. They were martyred for their belief. We don't have a lot of that detail. The early church details some of it. How, How thorough it is and how much we can actually trust all of it is really anybody's guess. But we do know here Jesus says, this is what awaits you. We have at least, we know that it happened to Stephen. So that's the most notable of the ones that are recorded for us in Scripture. But if it happened to Stephen, it's going to happen to anyone who dares not back away from what they believe. It's going to put them in that place of peril. So Jesus says, think about how twisted this is. The day is going to come. When if they catch one of you and put you to death, they're going to think that God would approve of it and that they offer to them or to him their service of putting someone to death. It's just twisted stuff. These things, verse 3, they will do to you. Now, why? Because they have not known the Father, nor have they known me. It's a repetition of what he said earlier, but the context is they're going to do this to you, even to the point of putting you to death. And they would do so thinking that God's approving of it, but God would never do so. They're in a place of rejection of both me and my father. That's why they do what they do. And they're so demented, they're going to think that it's a, it's a godly thing that they do. Verse 4. These things I have told you, that when the time comes, you will remember that I told you of them. So again, it's not one of those, this might happen. Remember, Jesus is saying, this is hard for you guys to hear, but I'm telling you these things so that when it happens that you'll remember that I said these things and not be taken so surprised or off guard and be so surprised by them. And he says, these things I did, I I did not say to you at the beginning because I was still with you. So I haven't been telling you all this the whole time. I've told you that, you know, there would be persecution that would come, but I've never, Jesus had never given them this level of detail before. But he does so because there's no reason to have done this while they were doing the ministry that they were doing. That's like, we have things to do right here and right now. Now that we're at the end of things, I'm telling you this because I'm going to the Father. Remember, he says that in at the end of chapter 13, into chapter 14, I'm going away. And where I go, you'll be able to follow eventually. So that's when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Because Thomas says, where are you going and why can't we follow? All of that happens. And here Jesus is really wrapping up the last parts of this. And so he is telling them about what is to take place. He's already mentioned to them the Holy Spirit. He's already said all of these things. I've just given you all the inside information so that when it comes to pass, you won't be taken off guard. You won't be surprised by it all. Now, when we get to verse 5, it really is a segue into the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Verse 5, we can see, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, Where are you going? 
But because I have said to you these things, now sorrow has filled your heart. I want to leave that for next week. But ultimately, he can see that there's a change in a reaction in them. Now, this must not have been easy for them to hear. So with what he is saying, he's also not done saying things. He's going to give them more reasons for hope. This starts out on a real downer. I mean, the day is coming when they put you to death and think that they do God a favor after they've kicked you out of the synagogue. That's horrible news. He's going to, he's going to now pivot back to them understanding this work of the Holy Spirit. What will he represent to the believer is different than what he's going to represent to the world. So we'll get into that. It's really hugely important. Again, there's more promise of the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he ends the chapter by recognizing, look, in this world, you're going to have some difficult times, tribulation, but be of good cheer. So when we look at these texts, again, as I've said before, it's hugely important that we recognize his immediate direct audience was the disciples, the apostles, the people who were going to be going with him to the Garden of Gethsemane for his arrest. They're going to be there during his trial. Peter's going to be one who's going to be kind of close by watching these things. John will be there at the foot of the cross as he dies. They're going to see all of these things. Everything that we're reading now is preparation for when those things take place. There will be a context to it. They'll understand when they see them that Jesus was not taken by surprise. And they will remember that he had spoken about those things, though it must have been impossible for them to imagine. Once they start to see it happen, then it's going to have to make sense because it's going to have come to pass. All of that said, how do we make application to us as the church? It helps us in our understanding that their world is yet different from ours, but we still see the same things in operation. The world hates us because it hated him and it hates him currently. Why? Because Jesus does this with every person who ever hears of him. It calls them to a decision. If they understand what he said and what maybe a believer would, would witness of him, you would be able to say that Jesus was sent by the Father to fix the problem of sin, and that by dying on a cross and then resurrecting from the dead, you can trust in his work of, of being a sacrifice for you to reconcile you back to the Father. The accountability that comes with that is that then I can't be the way that I've always been. That's correct. You can't be who you've always been. God calls you to something greater. So I can't do the things that I want to do. It means I've got to give stuff up and I've got to be a, a different person than I've always been all along. That's exactly what it means. People are going to rebel against that. Oftentimes, many of them will. But to those who say, great, but it's little, it, it's a little thing for me to give those things up because look at what I get in return. And that's really not even the, the reason why. It's not because we get stuff. It's because I recognize that the God who does not need me loves me and died in my place so that I could be reconciled to him because he decides he desires to have fellowship with me for all of eternity and anyone who believes as I do. That bothers some people. So you're telling me that without Jesus I can't get to heaven? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Well, who are you to say that? I'm nobody. That's his words. He's the one who said it. Everything that I'm reading to you, everything that I would say to anyone is based on something that was written 2,000 years ago. So my opinion means absolutely nothing. So if they say that, well, that's because that's what you see in the Bible. Okay, great. That's, the, that's your interpretation thing that we always hear. Great, read it for yourself. You tell me what he's saying. If it's different than what you think I'm telling you, you tell me what it says. It always comes back to the same thing. Jesus calls us to be separate from this world. He calls us to a life of difference. If we don't want anything to do with that, he's not going to force it upon you. But he's also going to hold you accountable for your decision. Same thing here. He's telling the disciples, you've made a different decision than those people. And because of it, they're going to hate you. Not only are they going to hate you, they're going to pursue after you. And if they catch you and the, the situation is right, they're going to put you to death and then go home at the end of the day and think that they're doing God a favor. That's the world that awaits you. But just know I told you about it before it happens. So make the application. We can see it in our world today. In some parts of the world, that is exactly what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. People who profess belief in Jesus will die this day simply because they do so. In the West, it's almost impossible for us to believe that because it just never happens to us. In fact, sadly enough, much of the church has basically made church into a social club. And basically, there's no cost to it at all. Basically, it's presented sometimes that, well, if you're just one of Jesus' disciples, look at all the great fringe benefits that you get. Because we can 
teach that garbage in the in the West. But it certainly doesn't work in the real world in much of the rest of the world. And the day's coming when it won't even work here in the West. We're seeing the glimpses of that. So everything as we think of it, sooner or later it has to come to an end. Will it happen in my lifetime? I believe so. But it doesn't have to. It will eventually because the scripture says so. And we see it happening elsewhere in the world and we see the beginning of it happening here. So with all that said, again, that doesn't make me lose hope at all because Jesus told me it would be this way. And so I'm not bothered by that. If the world hates the things that I'm saying, it's because I'm telling them what he said. So their problem is with him. It's not with me. I don't take it personal. I'm over it. Believer, it is for us to just say we hold close to him. Whatever this world wants to do and it wants to say, let it. Let them say it. Let them do it. Doesn't change our relationship with the Lord one bit. As it was for them, so it is for us. Circumstances different from them to us, but we can make the correct application and realize this world's not going to like us. We're not supposed to make this world like us. What we want to do is to present the world with an option where they can escape the judgment that's coming for the small group that will. We just need to be faithful to give that message. So until next week, we'll pick up with this work of the Holy Spirit and how he will work in the world that they're going into. It helps them with understanding that Jesus is giving them their equipping. As I close this, at the end of the video, you'll see a website uh, address there. If you have any questions about what we've covered here, please let me know. Send me an email. I'd love to answer those emails. And uh, if you have anything that you'd like to know further, that's where you can do so. Um, as long as we are able to get on YouTube, I know one of these days I'm going to probably say something that's going to hack off the wrong person and they're going to want to start, you know, fighting with YouTube about removing the content. That may very well happen. It's happened to a lot of people that I know. As long as we can, remember, you can also go and if you're watching YouTube, great, subscribe. But if ever there's a problem with content, you can go to our, our ministry website, oldpaththeology.net, and I also put all the studies up there as well so that you can grab those things from there as well. So with all that said, we'll pick up next week at verse uh, 5 and then into the work of the Holy Spirit starting at verse 7, and then we'll work through the rest of chapter 16. We might get through all, it, uh, of, all of it the next time. But until then, uh, keep, keep pursuing after the Lord in his word. Go back and reread what we looked at. Go read those passages in the book of Acts. The first nine chapters are really eight, and you'll get a chance to see the rollout of all of what Jesus said would happen happened in those eight chapters, and you can see it in great detail. Until then, God bless you.